Hey everybody, Neil Schaefer here. Welcome to another live stream edition of the Your Digital Marketing Coach podcast. E-commerce is still a critical piece for many businesses out there. And when it comes to e-commerce marketing, or these days, the focus away from Amazon and the way from us to directly sell to customer, i.e. DTC, direct-to-consumer e-commerce marketing, there is a lot of work that you need to do. And of that work, something that doesn't get talked a lot about I think in the e-commerce space, we've had previous guests, a lot of talk about you know Facebook ads and what have you. A lot of things that don't get talked about revolve around SEO. So today, I'm really excited to have an expert in the space. He is the host of the Ecom Show podcast. He is all, also the CEO of the e-commerce marketing agency, Blue Tusker, Andrew Math. Andrew, welcome to the show. Hey, Neil. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Now, I'm excited to get into the topic today. Uh, I've had previous guests, like I said, talk about the topic. Uh, before that, I want to get started. Um, I've talked with you know e-commerce marketing experts that have different backgrounds. Some have like had their own product. Some have worked at big uh, DTC brands and have sort of you know sharpened their axe there. So, uh, Andrew, you know, tell us the backstory of how you got started in all this. Uh, I've been in e-commerce digital marketing for a little over 15 years now. Um, my father actually acquired, a, a small business that was just brick and mortar at the time. And he wanted to bring it on, uh, at, online. And so I was like, that sounds really cool. So I actually worked in his warehouse for a while and then joined him. And so that's kind of where I, I learned, uh, in the beginning. Then, uh, in college, I was actually, uh, in a touring band, I was a drummer and we needed a marketer as well, someone who could handle doing promotions and things like that. And I was like, I have most of the experience. And so I started there. I then started uh, an agency in college that was kind of around retail and hospitality, um, merged that, exited that, went in-house several for several years uh, with multiple. I was uh, at, at the time, two different eight, like eight plus figure brands, D to C, uh, sole marketer in house. So I spent all my time juggling different agencies and different contractors. Uh, then left that, started another agency. Uh, we exited that in late 2019. And I started Blue Tusker in early 2020 with the concept of having like an agency of agencies simply because of the issues I had when I was in house. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, two interesting things. I was smiling because I also play drums and I also, ah. was the, I also was the marketer. I mean, this is, uh, in Japan, early Something internet days, <laughs> but I was the one who put up our website, uh, who printed out all our flyers and everything. So that's so funny. Um, I'm curious, the timing of Blue Tusker of 2020, was it in any way related to a response to COVID or was it just coincidental timing? It was just coincidental. We, we actually started in January, technically. Um, gotcha. So we had, we had, exited, uh, I had exited another agency in late 2019, and it was also a full service e-commerce agency and left there relatively quickly started in January of 2020. And within about a year or less, we ended up getting a majority of our clients back and even some of the people that work there. So it kind of got dissolved from the people that had acquired us. And I've basically started it up all over again. Nice. So I'm sure you work with lots of different types of brand, seven figure, eight figure, if not above. And I'm really curious, obviously, I want to interview you because you brought up the topic of SEO, which I'm a big fan of. And I, I also believe in the e-commerce space. It's not not given enough love. So why <laughs> of all the things that we could talk about today in terms of e-commerce marketing for DTC, uh, why, uh, you know, why SEO? Let's start there. I'm always a big fan of SEO because to me, it's, it's you're building the asset, right? Specifically for DTC, the way I see it. If you're going to exit one day, whether you're an Amazon seller or you have your own website, really the only thing that you have is you know your profitability, your processes, the people that you have, that kind of stuff. But what other assets can you have that are very valuable? One is obviously going to be like an email list. So if you have a good community to work with, your valuation is significantly higher. But another is the amount of traffic that you're able to get to your website because you can pixel those. So I always use uh, you know like an example of if I was a... Uh, let's say a D2C fishing company and a a company that did hunting wanted to acquire me, my audience is going to be really aligned with theirs. They could just drop their pixel on our site and be able to expand their other business. So when they go for an acquisition, people start to look at what other assets does this company have? And then you look at the obvious. Let's say you're not looking to exit. 
having that organic traffic coming in and letting people just get introduced to the brand that way really starts to reduce your customer acquisition costs over time. So you're not mm. so reliant on CPC. And if CPCs keep going up the way that they've been doing every year, it's not going to be very feasible for a lot of people. It's just forcing more inflation online. So by having an SEO approach, you're not so held to that. So I think that, thank you very much. I think theoretically, a lot of people sort of, they get it, but they never see it in action or they don't know how to track it or they're doing it the wrong way. So on that note, yeah. uh, before we set up this interview, you were talking about how seven and eight figure DDC brands structure their blog articles and the features they add to them to drive more conversion and not just traffic. So traffic is great, but a conversion is even better, right? So, um, yeah. you know, take us, take us behind the scenes of what that looks like. Yeah. Uh, I always say you can't pay your bills with organic traffic. It's a, it's a vanity metric. Yes, you can retarget them and that kind of stuff. But if you can get them to convert, you can get them to convert. And the one thing that's always very interesting that I find is you you do work, we will work with people all the time that actually do have a strong focus on SEO and maybe they're getting a lot of traffic. And if it's mostly non-branded traffic, there's a good chance a lot of that's going to their blog. So if, if the first place that someone lands on your website is your blog because of what they were searching for you, it's kind of ridiculous to not put some kind of elements into your blog to get people to convert. So I'm a big fan of CRO as well, because I think investing in your website also helps reduce customer acquisition costs over time, improves retention, et cetera. Nine times out of 10 blogs like as a CRO uh, strategy are completely overlooked. And so we love doing like right when we get started with people, you know, we're working with a new brand. The first thing we do is we'll actually do a CRO audit of just their blog so that we can look at, you know, do you have, um, you know, we'll make like little custom banners that you're not going to run ads on your own website, but you can make them so they look kind of like yours. So let's promote a product. Let's promote a collection page. Um, you know, certain apps will give you the functionality to change them all on each blog that you do. So if you're having a sale, let's put that front and center. Uh, the pop-up that you have, is it relevant to the blog that you have? Is there, is it, got any kind of gated content? Do you have um, a sidebar where you want to feature certain products or you want, maybe you have some kind of gated content you want to offer there? When people come to your blog, they're really there just to learn something. Your bounce rate is still, it, it shouldn't be too high, but the amount of time that they have on, on that actual page is not very long. They're only there for a few minutes trying to find an answer. They're not reading your massive article. So to have stuff on there to try to get them to convert is really important so that you're not solely focused on organic traffic. You're also focused on how do I get them to convert or at least get their email address. Right. That, that That's so true. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're in the B2B space and you're doing blogging, you might be having more lead magnet uh, types of things. But I always find it funny when so many companies don't make use of their own internal blog you know, within the text of placing those things that look like ads. Um, don't know why so many people don't think about that, but uh, I think that approach is awesome. I love the personalized approach based on the content topic that defines what those things look like, the sidebar, the pop-up. And once again, I don't think a lot of companies go that far into that. So, uh, you know, based on doing that, I always say, you know, the success of the SEO is the traffic, but if it's not converting, yeah. and obviously there's a hard to convert and a soft convert, the hard to convert is to become a customer, the soft is that email. How do you balance those two things? Obviously, we want to promote the product first, but how do you balance that if they don't buy the product, at least get their email address when you when you construct this CRO strategy? Um, when we're looking at just blogs for that specific example, I will typically lean more towards getting gated content. So it, to your point, like a soft conversion than I would a hard conversion. Mm. If the product is above your average cost, let's say, right? If you've got a product that's like, you know, sub $50, that barrier to entry isn't as high. So it could be more likely that they're willing to convert. And it could also depend on the article. Like if the article is written and the you know the keywords that you're targeting do have a bit of a higher purchase intent then i'm going to lean more towards like let's push them to product let's push them to collection page maybe i give them you know 10 percent off their first order or something classic like that but if it's something that's a lot more like informative and it's a little bit more top of funnel then i'm going to ease into it then i'm going to look at more of that soft conversion gated content you know to your point this is a relatively standard practice for b2b marketing and it's always something that I found shocking that D2C sellers, like they just don't do it. Like their blogs yeah. are just, they're, it, they're not structured correctly. There's, you know, a couple H tags and that's it. There's no links, there's no imagery. 
you know, people think that I'm just going to write all these words and throw it up on a blog and I'm going to start to rank really well. But like, if you're breaking, if you're not breaking up copy or, and you know, you don't have any images, you don't have bullet points, stuff like that, it's hard to read. And so you get this high bounce rate. You're not going to convert anything. So there's, there's so many different things where there's just not a focus on the way your blog looks and functions, let alone the copy that you're putting up there. Right. And, and, you know, I've worked uh, as a fractional CMO, I work with a lot of different industries and I've worked with some e-commerce clients and it's always, they don't get the blog, but it's funny going through what you just mentioned, I guess, even if they don't, you know, hard or soft convert, they're still pixeled in. So there's still that potential, right? At a worst case scenario, um, which yeah. once again is another, another benefit of the blog. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, you, you can have those keywords that you're going after that have a very high intent, right? They have a purchase intent or they're clearly looking for information that's relevant to your product. But what a lot of sellers don't think about is you can also look at how do you just attract a relevant audience, right? So for example, we've done a lot of work with uh, this beef jerky company and we're putting out like two or three articles a week that not that really don't talk about beef jerky very often, but they're, you know, it's kind of a keto friendly snack. And so like, it also kind of comes into like exercise and take care of yourself. It's a travel snack. So like mm -hmm. we're doing articles about like hiking and outdoor events and, you know, different uh, snacks to take to games. And it's very, very high level. But if I could, all I need to do is attract a relevant audience. And then my, either my gated content or my retargeting ads are going to pick up and do the work from there. So it's, it's a much more top of funnel approach, but a lot of D2C sellers would be like, why do, what do I need a blog for? Like, you know, my audience isn't reading blogs, but like, that's not accurate at all. And pretty much everyone is reading a blog. It's just a matter of what is the content you're putting out? And is it very high, like top of funnel where you're just trying to bring in a relevant audience or are you writing it to try to get them to convert? Cause there could be two very different things. Yeah, uh, I agree 100%. And on that note, uh, another thing that we discussed was how to focus content creation on keywords that have buyer intent, not just informational keywords. So can you go a little bit? And I think that's that's really where the rubber hits the road when it comes to SEO. But can you can you talk about or elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, exactly. So kind of like uh, like I mentioned with, you know, some stuff is really top of funnel. Others is not. It's got more of a purchase intent. So um, let's go... Uh, but let's go back to the the fishing one, the uh, the fishing example I had. I don't know why I don't fish very often, but um, so like let's say uh, you're a fishing company and you sell bait, right? Or you sell um, uh, fishing lures. So you're uh, writing an article about you know the top X fishing lures to catch sea bass, right? So that is a very clearly high intent. They're trying to find fishing lures. So that one's got a higher intent. So that one, you definitely want to make sure you've got, you know, a uh, little like we'll do like custom banners over to products or to collection pages. If you want to have some kind of incentive, like, hey, try one of these lures, get 10% off, that kind of thing. Those are fantastic. Mm -hmm. But we focus really heavily on, on a, a relatively like traditional pillar approach. So basically you write a significantly longer article that has, is very, has a ton of information in it. And then it's broken out into all these different sections. And then we make other articles that expand on those sections. So basically you're writing one big piece. You have all these other little pieces that link to the pillar piece and you focus on driving traffic to the pillar piece. Your page authority for the little, the smaller blogs goes up. And then with that pillar piece, let's say that part of it was, um, you know, uh, the best lures to use when fishing. And one of those was specific to sea bass. So that's my tiny little blog that I've got. Now I've got all my product links to it. So the more that I can improve the page authority of that page, my product's page authority will also go up. So when you're looking at words that have a higher buyer intent, you really have to make sure that that's where you're layering in promoting certain products, linking to certain products, because if you can get the ranking of that article to improve, your products will go along with it. So it's really a, an approach to get your products to rank better. Because we'll get questions all the time about, you know, uh, should we be having like, you know, 2000 words on our product pages? And I, I personally don't think that that works very well at all. Yes, you can do it. And yes, from an SEO perspective, it might get you to rank better. But the issue is when you load up that much copy on a product page, it's extremely overwhelming. The consumer feels like there's so much information here. I don't want to read it, but I also feel like I'm going to miss something important. So they just don't buy it at all. So it'll hurt your conversion rate. 
So product pages, while you make sure that you know they're written for a keyword perspective so that you can try to get them to rank, you've got to walk a really fine line so that you're not hurting your conversion rate. Yeah, and I love that you also mentioned uh, the unsung hero of SEO, which is internal linking of actually making it easy for people to get from your blog to the page, but also giving them that that SEO juice should that blog yeah. post rank. So yeah, excellent advice. I wanted to ask you, and I guess because of the timing, this is March 15th, I don't think we could have a conversation about SEO without talking about the recent Google updates. So, and this is the first time that my site, actually the first two times over the course of more than a decade that even my site has taken a hit. Uh, so we had the Google helpful content update, obviously last fall. And then we had the most recent sort of anti-spam update. And mm -hmm. I suppose if you're always writing great content for humans with personal experience, personal opinion, um, then you, you're not going to have any issues, right? But unfortunately yeah. in, in business, that doesn't always happen all the time. So I'm curious um, what you have seen. Have you seen any changes? Would you change any advice that you're giving uh, based on what, what's been going on? Because there's certain industries, for instance, recipe bloggers I know have that rely on ad revenue have really <laughs> taken a hit. Um, yeah. And that's obviously if you have a lot of ads in your site and most DTC brands would not have ads on their site. So it's not an issue, but just curious if you've seen anything. Yeah, um, we've definitely seen a handful of clients already where, you know, they got hit and others where it did the opposite. And it, you know, all of a sudden they were scaling up over the past like week. Um, so it's still very new that we're trying to figure out like, all right, how is this going to shake out? Mm. Every time Google does something, though, like this, it goes up and it goes down and then it kind of levels out a little bit. Everyone panics for a little while and then they forget about it. At the end of the day, though, it's still it's still really funny to me because it's a very common thing for all marketers is like, how can I hack this system? Right. Quick oh. wins. Uh, back in the day, it was, you know, little tricks of the trade you can do with Facebook. Amazon sellers had more little things that they thought they could do that were like kind of gray hat, like all the time. And every single day, it never ceases to amaze me the amount of people that still implement strategies like that and don't realize that if you just play the game correctly, you're in a much better position. Every great, every large company you think of, all the Fortune 500 companies, all these big guys, from a marketing perspective, they're not sitting there trying to hack the system. They're not getting black hat backlinks they're not, you know, doing these weird like drive traffic to a page that's a blank page, but auto redirects and it gives you like, it, it's ridiculous. Like all that stuff is so wildly unnecessary. And so if you're writing bad content or if you are just spamming a ton of ridiculous keywords into an article, like you deserve to get hit. Like, fine, like let, let them fall. Like you have to be putting out quality content. It's the, and I know that this is going to come up it's the same conversation we have with AI all the time. Yeah. Sometimes, yes, we absolutely use AI because it's quicker. It allows us to speed up the research. If from a writing perspective, it's great. However, you still have to have a subject matter expert overseeing the writing process. You still have to have a traditional editor who's editing everything and ensuring that you're following the brand voice guideline and all that stuff. You still have to have people back uh, double checking research, linking to correct places, implementing it into your website correctly with the st proper structures and imagery and breaking it up so it's easy to read. Like there's so many other aspects outside of the AI thing that like like everyone's like, why do I even need articles anymore if I can just do AI? Like, go ahead. Go do AI for like a month and let me know how that works out for you. It does look good. It does sound good. But it, it, it's like, it's like looking at, um, which I'm sure you've seen like the AI videos, like you, yeah. it's like, you just know it's a little off. Like, it's like, yeah. there's something that makes you uneasy about it. That's how I feel about if you just let AI write the article and just leave it as is, it's like, uh, it's kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah, and I think if we look back at history, this is obviously one way Google is trying to control, you know, every company on earth, just AI generating tons of content and throwing it up there. Uh, it's just interesting yeah. because my content doesn't do any of those things you talked about. And I'm sure like other, you know, other companies get hit. And um, yeah, it, it'll be interesting. And, and I agree that if you're doing the right thing from the first part, you just keep doing what you're doing. And over time, it'll adjust. Uh, and I'm, I'm a big believer in that. I don't think the algorithm or Google hates uh, any business in particular, but they want you to yeah. create helpful content. You should be creating helpful content. So, um, so thanks yeah. for, yeah. 
And I find it's also with um, just refreshing your content. That's another issue that I find so many people, they write a blog, they publish the blog, and then they just move on to the next one. And Google likes it when you refresh things. So like to your point, our site, there was a handful of articles that I saw in the past week, they all took a hit. But they're also articles that we haven't updated since like 2021. So I looked at it and I was like, yeah, I kind of understand it. And then there's other ones where we've refreshed them recently, like in the past few months, and they went up. So it's kind of a matter of like, so many people write articles and then they just publish them and go, ah, we didn't rank for that word. Let's move on to the next one. But really what you're supposed to do is focus a specific article on a specific keyword and then just keep tweaking it and keep adjusting it. You're going to write your other uh, articles that are relevant to it and linking. And there's a lot of other like technical aspects that go around that. But you can't just write one for a keyword and it doesn't work out and you move on to the next. You have to constantly be refreshing it, constantly be adjusting it, pulling reports, seeing what you've got to adjust so that Google likes to know that it's fresh new content and you're keeping an eye on it as opposed to just pumping out a ton of stuff that ChatGPT did for you. Yeah, and I, I think it's also interesting. I, uh, you know, I, I don't have a DTC site. It's more of an information site. I'm a speaker, consultant, author, right? So yeah. I tend to have a lot of listicle posts, but a lot of listicle toasts, uh, listicle posts about technology. And what I've noticed is specifically in these sorts of like I'm looking for an AI paraphraser. Um, and when you look or like influencer marketing tools, I'll, I'll give that as a great example. And in the past, in the top 10 results, there would be a lot of articles like top 15 influencer marketing tools or what have you. And I've seen a lot of those keyword phrases that used to have a lot of those listicles. Google's just not showing listicles anymore. It's just showing companies, right? And I'm wondering yeah. if Google is realizing that the future of the search engine is pay to play is those companies that they want to pay up. They're starting to give them a little bit better search engine results so that they see the value of the traffic. I don't know. It's just my own personal feeling when I see that. Um, obviously, this comes down to search intent and how they rank things based on search intent, but definitely some significant shifts. And that might explain why some companies are actually seeing an improvement uh, in their traffic. So we'll wait and see. That's just my personal theory. No data yet, but uh, but yeah. I, I do feel that this was a pretty significant, you know, the first in like a, a five, you know, Bert Panda on that scale of change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there. I mean, there's proven stuff around if you're uh, running a good amount of Google ads and all of a sudden, you know, you were to stop them, you're going to see your organic traffic fall. And that yeah. is, you know, it, you could theorize it's Google just knowing that they're not getting money from you anymore. And so they did it. But there's also just a matter of less page views, less traffic to the site. Uh, you know, your bounce rate might not be as good. Like there's less activity on your site. So from a ranking perspective, that's what Google's looking at. So you start to fall. It makes a lot of sense. Google's starting to show more, um, uh, you know, more companies to your point, as opposed to like listicles. You could argue that maybe it's because those companies are probably running a pretty good amount of Google ads and spending a good amount of money and getting a good amount of traffic for it. And so they're like, you know what? We actually know the best influencer uh, marketing, you know, tool out there because they're paying us to say so, and so like they get increased. Yeah. You get theories around that, um, but you know, then you start looking at longer tail keywords and you find kind of different approaches to it. But sure. um, you know, it'll be interesting every time they do a big update like this. There's a really big shakeup. I remember one in fall, we had a client of ours that just uh, when Google did the update in fall, we had a client of ours that just like threw us in a panic. We were like, ah, crap. Like they just tanked. And then in like a week, they were completely back where they were and trending back in the right direction. And we didn't do any major changes. So it was kind of a matter of, it was extremely drastic, which is why I remembered it. Cause I was like, I don't know what Google's doing, but like it, it's, it's sometimes it's just a matter of like wait it out and let the algorithm kind of shake itself out. Cause it's almost like they put in new rules and then they almost do like a reset as well. At least that seems to be how it feels a lot of times. So sometimes I'll just let it like, let's let it sit for a good like 30, 60 days and see what happens and then see if there's anything else we need to change. But nine times out of 10, Google is simply putting new rules into place to make sure that you're putting out quality content. So as long as you're always focused on that, be fine. Yeah. And to your point, I often see before these big changes, I often see a little spike in traffic, then a huge drop and then a level off. And it seems, okay, when I see the spike in traffic, I want to celebrate, but I have a feeling the change is in the air. Like when we have hot weather here in Southern California, I, I used to call it earthquake weather because we tend to get earthquakes on hot days. So, mm. so anyway, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's really interesting. And um, I mean, obviously you have, you have AI and you have the competition from them. 
uh, that's also in the background here. But uh, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens over time. And we really don't know what's going on. I, I also take this as an opportunity because I think there's the content quality, but I think there's also this, you know, the, the EEAT and just the trustworthiness of the website. Like, do you have a cookie uh, management software, which I actually never had. And I'm sort of embarrassed about that. So I, I started implementing that and really looking at the top sites in my niche that didn't get hit and then saying, okay, what are they doing that I'm not doing and using this as an opportunity to improve, uh, not just the content, but also those infrastructure pieces or the user experience. So, uh, so yeah, it's all good. Um, we, we learn from, uh, from these algorithm changes for sure. And hopefully we improve. Yeah, exactly. That's why they do them. At least I think. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> I, I think they are there to educate us. So one other thing, you know, we talked about like at a micro level about, you know, blogs and SEO keywords. And, you know, one other thing we want to talk about today is like taking a step back areas on your e-commerce website to add additional copy to improve SEO rankings without sacrificing conversion rates. It sounds like getting the best of both worlds. Uh, yeah. So I'm curious as to what your strategy is there behind that. So that, that kind of... Uh is a little bit about what I was mentioning too with the product pages. Like you can add on more copy to try to get your product pages to rank better. But if you add on too much, it can really hurt your conversion rate. Like I know everyone who's listening to this podcast right now, if they went to, a, if they Googled something and they went to a page and it was all copy, unless you're Googling a certain novel and you found it, there's a good chance you're going to be really overwhelmed. You're not going to want to read it. You can't, you know, skim through to try to find the exact answer you want by just, you know, headlines catching your eye. So too much copy can really hurt your overall conversion rate. Now, this is where SEO and CRO kind of combine. And typical of every marketing strategy, they all overlap with everything. But this one is where it can get a little interesting because... So for us specifically is, you know, we're a full service agency. So I have a team that just does CRO. I have a team that just does SEO. And sometimes they butt heads. And it's simply because SEO wants more words on the page. CRO teams tell them like, uh-uh, not happening. So like, it's it's comical to watch it. But like, you've got it on a product page, let's say, right? Like, you'll get people like, oh, I'll just, I'll stuff up the product description. Like, no, 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 you don't want to do that. What you could explore, though, is maybe down below towards maybe where your reviews are at, add in like an FAQ section with like an accordion option. So if Amen. they want more copy, let them have it. But that way it's on the page, it's getting indexed, but you're not forcing it on them. The the one that the thing that came to my head though, um, when you first brought that up, nine times out of 10, I'm looking at their collection page, right? So the page mm. where, you know, all their products are listed before they get to their product page adding additional copy underneath the products, right? So let's say you're, uh, you're shopping, you're um, looking at, uh, we're gonna do fishing again. You're looking at lures, you've got pages and pages of lures, right? So you get down at the bottom, you have the pag uh, paginated, like, oh, there's five pages of lures here. Beneath that, it's usually just, it goes right into your footer. So nine times out of 10, underneath the pagination and above your footer, we're going to add a good chunk of copy. We might do like a paragraph or two, but then we might also layer in FAQ. We might layer in like some like more like branded areas with imagery and copy. And even though uh, like if you upload like a heat map to your website and you take a look at like, you know, where are people going, they may not get down there. It's going to help you from an SEO perspective because you have more terms and more key uh, more keywords on that uh, page. And depending on the words that you're using, Typical SEO structure, you want to have internal links. Maybe you want to have outbound links. You know, you want to have specific callouts. That's another great spot for you to link to specific articles that you're mentioning or other products. So there's areas on your uh, on on your D2C site that you can get to rank better from an SEO perspective. You've just got to tread lightly so that you don't hurt your conversion rate. And typically the ones that have the highest intent that you want to make sure are showing up are going to be your product pages and your collection pages. So that means you've just got to be careful about overloading with too much copy. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, even getting to the battle between CRO and SEO is a positive thing that you're seriously <laughs> looking at both issues. So I, so that's good, but, but yeah, it's funny because for those that don't know, Shopify, CMS, will just automatically create this collections page and it becomes an integral part of your website. And it's sort of like these category pages on WordPress that become pages that you have the ability to add text in, you know, on top of that before they show all the posts, once again, for SEO. I never thought that about collection pages. So that makes uh, you know a lot of sense. But obviously, if you have too much, then your conversion goes down. So you need that 
you need the yin and the yang, right? That perfect combination. So that's really awesome advice, Andrew. I, I really love, you know, uh, to all of my listeners, there's a lot of people that pitch me to want to come on this podcast. And I, you know, obviously, uh, Andrew and I, this is the first time we've ever talked, but I try to do my best beforehand to really understand what their thoughts are, what value they can add. And, and it's really awesome talking with an expert who truly knows his stuff, um, yeah. as I think you all hear from, uh, from our conversation <laughs> here. So Andrew, um, yeah, really love the talk. Just real, uh, you know, basic meat and potatoes, real straightforward, easy to understand advice, obviously based on a lot of experience. Um, you know, tell the listener how they can find about more you, about you, your podcast and your agency, like, you know, what types of customers you're looking for um, and how can they contact you? Yeah. Um, bluetusker.com. It's B-L-U-E-T-U-S-K-R. We are a full service marketing company for e-commerce sellers. We basically act as like an outsourced marketing department for the most part. Um, you can find out more about me. Uh, let's see, LinkedIn, obviously, Andrew Maff. Um, I also, andrewmaff.com is easy enough and all my social stuff is on there. Uh, the Ecom Show podcast, it's a weekly podcast where I interview uh, different D2C sellers and other experts in the industry. And uh, we also have the Click and Conversion newsletter, which is a weekly newsletter that I co-author that goes out um, on a weekly basis, kind of an update of what's going on in the e-commerce industry, specifically more on the D2C side. And that's relevant for people with their own D2C sites, Amazon sellers, Walmart sellers, pretty much everything from an e-commerce perspective. Awesome. We heard it right there. If you're in, if e-commerce is your thing, you definitely want to hook up with Andrew follow him on the socials, listen to his podcast, subscribe, subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, and if you're looking for an agency, definitely reach out. Andrew, this has been awesome. Any other advice just looking at, you know, as the year goes by, we obviously have the, the SEO part, email part. We have paid advertising, paid media. We have organic social. Any other sort of trends that uh, or, or advice you'd like to give our listeners? Um, Really, SEO and CRO are the two things that I always find to be something that most sellers don't take a strong enough focus on. And mainly in my opinion, it's because specifically paid ads, it's, you know, it's money in money out. You get quick wins. It's like gambling, but SEO and CRO are going to reduce those, those customer acquisition costs over time. So your paid advertising will actually perform better. If you start focusing on your SEO, getting in organic traffic and CRO, making sure that the traffic you are getting is converting better. So investing into your website's improvements over time and building that website into an asset to me is significantly more important than just pouring gas into Google ads and Facebook ads and TikTok ads if TikTok survives. And so like there's, you know, it, it's just a matter of focus on the future as well as the present so that you're thanking yourself later on down the line because SEO and CRO take a long time to start to show their face. But once you start, you're going to be really glad you did. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I just hope that more uh, e-commerce you know, uh, business owners would listen to what you're saying uh, and the world will be a better place. And, and yeah, it's <laughs> to me, I mean, it's, well, it's just, it's about building an asset and the Facebook ads, the Google ads just do not, you know, build asset. So you might be successful yeah. today, there's no guarantee you're successful tomorrow. You don't own any of that, but you own your asset, your content, the traffic, you know, optimize. So all great advice. Andrew, thank you so much for uh, spending your time with us today and looking forward to connecting again in the future. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.